Wei La enjoys her leisure time in the maid's lounge, relieved that she hasn't been disturbed by Bai Lu Oxun over the past hour. But wait, this seems sus. The maids are all hanging out in her lounge, making her question why they're not doing any work. The maids reply that Bai does all the heavy work, making their lives easier. He even takes care of the monsters, the hardest task in their schedule. They then go on to praise Bai Lu Oxun. One of the maids even plans to propose to him, but she's too young for that. Wei La then reminds the maids of their responsibilities as female demons. They can't leave all the heavy work to a man and slack off in the lounge. Wei La then calls Shi Yao Feng, commanding her to check on Bai Luo Chun. Although Shi Yao Feng has only slept for two hours, she complies with Wei La's command, afraid that her wages might be deducted. Shi Yao Feng then retrieves a logbook from her melons, which is a nifty storage area if you ask me. She reports to Wei La that the gatekeeper at the back mountain wrote that Bai had left at half past ten in the morning, following a maid towards the abyssal mine. Upon hearing where Bai is, the maids quickly freak out. There are rumors about ghosts and zombies in that mine, and it is known to have a mortality rate of 90%. Meanwhile, Wei La wonders why she hasn't been informed about Bai's departure. Sona from the estate must be responsible for it, but it still seems suspicious. She ultimately decides to let the issue be, believing that Bai Luo Chun will come home in time for dinner. She then disperses the maids, telling them to return to their post and pretend to be busy. Wei La is reassured by the thought that Bai is fine, thinking that no one can control him anyway. As long as he honors their agreement, all is good. Just then, Wei La is shocked to see all the maids kneeling before her with googly eyes. They plead with her to go and check on Bai because he has no magical powers, despite being strong. They're all worried that he might die or lose his way. Wei La dismisses the idea, but the maids are persistent. She loves her maids so much that she'd do anything for them, so she reluctantly agrees. After all, she also wants to know who dared to take Bai Luo Chun without informing her. Meanwhile, Bai Luo Chun arrives at the entrance to the Abyssal Mines, and he's surprised that it's built on top of the mountain. The maid explains that the mine is an incredibly massive underground maze, and they have done a lot of work to establish a stronghold. Just then, Bai Luo Chun goes off without notice, so she hurriedly follows him. At the entrance, Bai finds an old handicapped man napping in a corner. He wakes him up, asking for help in descending into the mines. The man agrees to Bai's favor, and he takes a precious item with him. However, before going, he tells the maid to return to the estate, as she's not permitted to go with them. The man also warns Bai that the elevator is a bit defective, so they may run into minor troubles. Later on, Bai and the old man reach the middle layer of the abyssal mine. The old man praises Bai Lu Chun for his calmness, as most people would shake in fear upon entering the place. Suddenly, Bai notices a group of birds flying towards the elevator. Uh, oh, seems like trouble. These are no mere birds, but mid-level demon creatures called abyssal birds. The man wonders where they came from, as they haven't reached the middle lower level yet. These menaces are known to snatch people from the elevator and eat them. It seems like this old man has a different concept of minor trouble. Despite the ambush, Bai slashes the abyssal bird in half. However, the birds won't stop coming at them. So Bai urges the old man to come up with a solution or he won't be able to ensure the safety of the defective elevator. Just then, the old man remembers that abyssal birds are social creatures, so he grabs the treasure that he brought. It's Dragon's Breath Grass, a rare treasure that can only be found at a depth of 50 meters in the deep level. He then ignites it, shooing the abyssal birds away. It can not only simulate the breath of a dragon, but it also emits the roar of the said beast. This drives the menacing birds away for good, leaving the old man grateful to Bai, as he protected them from the initial attack. Later on, the two finally reach the lowest point of the abyssal mines. The old man informs Bai Lu of Chun that the stronghold is located about five kilometers away from the elevator, and he'll have someone bring the mounts over to help them get there. Just then, Bai catches sight of a huge ant, so the old man explains that it's called the Abyssal Shepherd Ant. These creatures will help maintain the security of the stronghold, as long as they're sacrificed with white magic. Bai then sees a couple of laborers being attacked by the Shepherd Ant, and one of them is David. Bai immediately jumps into action, slashing the creature into pieces before it can hurt his friend. With a nonchalant expression, he tells David not to die on him, as he hasn't even attended his wedding yet. David asks Bai Lu Chun why he came to the mines, and the latter replies that he's out for a walk. David goes on to share that he's using a low-tier earth magic taught to him by Mutu, their squad leader. He adds that he uses it for construction, and it's quite useful. 
However, using it a few times exhausts his magical energy, and it's even harder for him to stand upright. Just then, Bai tells David not to loiter, or he'll become bug food. Unbeknownst to Bai, he's about to be attacked by a death worm larva, a lower-ranked demon. Despite David's warnings, Bai continues talking, saying there's no need for David to risk his life for money. He also promises to ask Wei La for job vacancies in the maid corpse, so David can move there. Suddenly, the death worm larva attacks. Bai is unfazed as he releases a two-star talisman attack, making the beasts explode into smithereens. David is in pure shock. How did Bai release high-tier magic without any mana? It just doesn't make sense. Bai replies that he didn't use magic, but cultivation. David is confused, but Bai promises to explain it later. First, they must deal with the swarm of bugs that are about to attack. Meanwhile, a soldier reports to his superior that the sacrifice for the Abyssal Shepherd and the White Demon is still alive. Lord Mapakuro, an upper-ranked demon, is pissed at his mushroom eating time is being disturbed. And yes, it's the type of mushroom that makes you feel funny. He demands his soldier to get him some female demons, but the soldier urges Mapakuro to act upon the issue as the ants will go wild if they don't receive their sacrifice. Upon hearing that the sacrifice is still alive, Mapakuro takes matters into his own hands. Meanwhile, Bai fights off the ants while allowing David to practice his cultivation. Despite Bai's attempts to teach him techniques, David struggles to execute them correctly. Suddenly, Mapakuro launches an attack, only to be intercepted by Bai. Infuriated, Mapakuro wonders why these rebels have gone against the contract. Before doing anything else, Bai urges David to practice the technique he was taught earlier. He then faces Mapakuro, asking if he's the boss. Mapakuro is surprised that Bai speaks the local tongue, and he asks if the rebels are at war with the manor. Bai clarifies that he is not a rebel, but a maid. He then informs Mapuchiro that David will no longer work in the mines, but will join the servant ranks. Any inquiries or objections from Mapuchiro should be directed to Wei La. Upon hearing that Bai works for Wei La, Mapuchiro figures out why he's rude and assertive. Consequently, Mapuchiro offers David the option to resign from his job, but with a grim condition, leaving his head behind. Doesn't seem like much of a choice, is it? Mapakuro suddenly launches an attack. Meanwhile, Bai is confused as to why this demon has to act so violently, when it's just about a laborer wanting to quit a job. Isn't this guy afraid of Wei La? Mapakuro replies that no one can leave just because they want to, and he's not afraid of Wei La at all. In fact, he challenges Bai Luo Chun to summon that woman right that very moment. While he's blabbing all these, Mapakuro keeps eating his mushrooms. I guess we can credit all his confidence to something. Bai is amazed that this brute isn't afraid of Wei La. Even someone as powerful as Bai can't take her down. Meanwhile, David informs Bai that they should leave, knowing that Mapakuro goes into full-on psycho killer mode when he's consuming his mushrooms. Out of nowhere, Mapakuro pulls off a high-tier magic rumbling earthquake attack, blowing the place up. Meanwhile, the old elevator man observes the fight and he hopes that Mapakuro finishes it quickly, as Wei La might appear anytime soon. It turns out that the man is no ordinary spectator, but a middle-ranked demon from the rebel camp called Thousand Faces. Thousand Faces suddenly speaks to the skull that he's carrying on a spike, saying that there are people in the area studying the forbidden arts of necromancy. Unbeknownst to him, a body with a severed head is walking toward him, eager to attack. However, a lower-ranked demon named Melt jumps into the rescue, ending the headless body. Melt reprimands Thousand Faces, criticizing him for speaking to the skull when he should be working. The old man replies that he can only talk about certain matters to the dead, and he has already finished his work. Melt asks if the target is reliable, and Thousand Faces replies that it depends on who wins. Meanwhile, somewhere in the layers of the Abyssal Mine, Wei La presents a hand-drawn portrait of Bai to a guard, inquiring if he has seen her maid. Not the best drawing, but we get the vision. However, the guard responds, that the elevator is out of service, preventing anyone from descending. Wei La expresses skepticism about the guard's honesty, emphasizing the maid corpse principles of integrity and fairness. The guard insists that the elevators are truly under maintenance, but Wei La only screams at him, saying that she's aware of how sus the circumstances are. This pressures the guard into pleading with Wei La, reasoning that he is nothing but a lowly worker who is unaware of the plans. However, at the back of the guard's mind, he can't help but worry about what Lord Thousand Faces might do, as it seems he can't hold off Wei La for much longer. 
Wei La then asks the guard for their logs, and there she finds that the white demons under Mapo Kiro have died or gone missing. With that much casualty, she wonders why the Ministry of Internal Affairs remains uninformed about the matter. After this, she returns the log book to the guard, and immediately jumps out of the window without notice. Before rescuing Bai Luo Chun, Wei La sets out to uncover the truth in stronghold number one. As Wei La departs, the guard's panicked state draws the attention of Lucy Wilton, the eldest daughter of the manor. Lucy wonders what the commotion is, so she asks her maid, Ye Zi, to investigate the matter. The guards tell Ye Zi that Wei La jumped out of the window, and upon hearing this, Lucy chuckles. She tells the guard not to worry about Wei La, as she's the strongest demon she has ever known. Ye Zi then asks the guard if the lift for the 31st stronghold is ready. The guard confirms that it is, so Lucy instructs her guard, Yi Kuing, to stay and coordinate with the others, while she and Ye Zi descend in the 31st stronghold. Meanwhile, Mapo Kiro is all tied up, and is dragged by Bai Luo Chun. Bai wonders how they should terminate David's employment certificate, and David replies that they only need the employer's demon power. They simply have to put a little blood on the certificate, and this will do the trick. As the two approach the gate, David tells the guards to open the entrance, and call for medical aid for the injured Mapo Kiro. Unbeknownst to the two, those aren't mere guards, but Melt and Thousand Faces. Melt asks what they should do, and Thousand Faces instructs her to proceed with their plan. Out of nowhere, Melt uses her powers to kill Mapochiro, melting his head in the process. David screams at Bai that Mapochiro is dead, but Bai tells him to relax and listen to what the two have to say. Thousand Faces suddenly descends to meet Bai, saying that he left too early, and that they didn't even have time to get to know each other. Bai merely rolls his eyes, asking why Thousand Faces had to kill someone, instead of just opening the doors. This old man's meet and greet doesn't seem too conventional. Thousand Faces replies that there is no need to open the door, because apart from Mapo Kiro and the four of them, there isn't anyone else in the vicinity. David is puzzled, as his colleagues are just around. Thousand Faces explains that those poor white demons are assigned elsewhere, so he doesn't need to worry. He adds that their organization kills evil people and black demons who have done bad deeds, and they would never kill innocent people. It so happens that Mapo Chiro was both an evil and a black demon, so it's kind of a double-dead situation. Formed approximately a decade ago, the Resistance emerged in response to the Empire's oppressive tactics. The Marshal of the Imperial Guards spearheaded a campaign against the Cultivators, intending to free all white demons and overthrow the Empire. Their vision extended beyond mere rebellion, they aimed to establish a unified nation, transcending racial divides. However, the Resistance was cruel to the Black Demons, providing them with only two options, submission or death. However, Thousand Faces believes it wasn't extreme at all, as Mapakira deserved to die. He adds that people will always have subjective views on what truly happened, but on the bright side, at least white demons aren't suppressed. He then offers Bai Luo Chun a chance to join the rebellion, but if he doesn't want to, then they won't trouble him further. David realizes that Thousand Faces is right, as the resistance is much respected by the white demons. Side note, Mapakira did deserve to die though. Meanwhile, Bai contemplates the offer presented by the rebels, as he senses a lack of transparency regarding their true identities. He suddenly uses a talisman on them, revealing their true forms. As Melt's headgear vanishes, Thousand Faces transforms, revealing her true female form. Of course, this melts her clothes in the process. Duh. Melt almost attacks Bai for revealing them, but Thousand Faces stops her. Taking charge of the situation, Thousand Faces introduces herself and Melt to Bai, disclosing their roles as overseers of the manor's stronghold. They emphasize their peaceful intentions and assure Bai that they pose no threat. Meanwhile, David is unimpressed at Bai, thinking he purposely melted Thousand Faces' clothes to appear dominant. Bai sighed, explaining that he didn't know she wasn't wearing anything underneath. Suddenly, Bai directs a question to Thousand Faces, asking about the purpose behind bringing him to the mines. Thousand Faces explains that she wanted to witness firsthand the extent of Bai's powers, having heard much about him from the maid course. Additionally, she mentions another undisclosed investigation, which is the reason why they didn't open the gates. Thousand Faces then commands Melt to proceed with their plans. Surprisingly, those they previously eliminated within the stronghold have returned as undead. So we're doing a Resident Evil arc now. Initially, they suspected someone was using white demons for necromantic experiments, but it isn't as simple as that. Normally, 
decapitating zombie demons break the link between their demonic core and brain, killing them. However, these new zombies are resilient, they refuse to stay dead, and show heightened aggression towards the living. Thousand Faces explains that resistance mages believe it's not traditional necromancy, but a fundamental alteration in the souls of demon zombies. If infected, this change could spread to humans. Despite efforts, a solution remains non-existent. Though rumors suggest the 31st stronghold serves as a dumping ground for infected corpses, this might explain why the zombies tend to congregate there. Additionally, these zombies tend to gather at places where they can sense a strong surge of magic. Just then, Thousand Faces instructs Melt to seal a hole. Jeez, why does she even melt it in the first place? Meanwhile, David finally figures out why his colleagues are dwindling in number. Just then, Thousand Faces informs Baya for speculation. The virus not only infects demons, but creatures as well. This would explain why the abyssal birds acted feral as they descended the mines. If this turns out to be true, then the consequences would be far too dire to control. Thousand Faces then urges Bai to assist her in investigating the matter. Knowing that it's for the better good, Bai agrees to help. But first, they must fight off the swarming hordes of demonic creatures that are out to get them. And yes, the sliced abyssal bird is still alive. In Shaja City, chaos erupts as the GU's people launch their attack. Dragon puppets wield their strong powers, and mysterious sphere wreaks havoc on the cityscape. Amid the chaos, Sheikah and Duo Duo do their best to protect the civilians. As Duo Duo slices a dragon puppet in half, she's impressed by the indigenous magic, because it allows her to refine her wings into becoming a weapon. Sheikah then asks what's the update, and Duo Duo reports that the sphere is emitting evil energy and is tough to break through. She also suggests that it might have sealed the sky, because it feels suspicious and ominous. Sheikah then asks Duo Duo if her magic doesn't work, and the latter only clarifies that it's not magic, but immortal arts. Duo Duo can't help but think how easy the situation would be if Bai Luo Chun were here. He can easily take down the GU's people and destroy their country at the same time. However, Duo Duo suddenly worries that Sheikah might perceive Bai Luo Chun as evil. So she clarifies that he's all for the better good. Sheka then wonders if Bai can destroy the creatures before them. This prompts Duo Duo to gaze into the sky. She sees the Empire's Air Force, the Griffin Corps, who are bringing with them a Type B1 Hell missile. Sheka can't help but scoff at the Empire's attempt to help, as she knows they're siding with the GU's people, despite acting like the mediators of the war. Sheka is furious, stating that those righteous men are the true monsters. Realizing that Sheka is getting consumed by her anger, Duo Duo reminds her that they came to the area to gather resources. They aren't ready for large-scale conflicts, and she didn't even bring enough talismans. However, Sheikah reassures her that she's taking responsibility for the mission, and she won't let anything happen to her. Out of nowhere, Sheikah emits a strong halo, making her burst into the heavens at a high speed. The sheer force of her ascension sends Duo Duo hurtling backward, and she's beyond worried about what Sheikah might do. True enough, Duo Duo's guess was accurate. The sky is indeed a trap, and it zaps Sheikah into a crisp. However, Sheikah uses an ancient spell that destroys the trap, making it erupt in the process. The sphere also gets destroyed, revealing a talisman within its core. Meanwhile, Sheikah, in all her upgraded glory, emerges victorious against the GU's people's evil sphere. However, a griffin suddenly attacks her, but she counters the attack with her sword. Unfortunately, she also slashes the bomb that the griffin was carrying, resulting in a massive explosion. This sends Sheikah plummeting from the sky, prompting Duo Duo to catch her from falling to her death. Duo Duo immediately uses a life-saving talisman, despite Sheikah's protest. However, her injuries are far too much to bear, so Sheikah falls unconscious. Later on, she wakes up in her underground base, and she receives a ton of yapping from Duo Duo for fainting. Sheikah apologizes for the inconvenience she has caused. She reasons that she has overused her powers, and if it weren't for Duo Duo, she would have died from the crash. She then thanks Duo Duo for bringing back many resources, and because of that, she has saved so many people. Duo Duo replies that she's happy to help, as Bai Luo Chun has taught her to do good deeds to pay off her sins. However, if Sheka truly wants to repay her, Duo Duo would appreciate it if she taught her the technique that upgraded her physique. Sheka suddenly gets frantic declaring that she will do anything, but teach her that. Jeez, chill, woman. 
Duo Duo doesn't press the issue further and she gently encourages Sheikha to rest. As she exits the room, she gets greeted by Aisha, who is gifting her a laurel wreath, made by him and the other kids. Assuming it's a gesture for Sheikha, Duo Duo tells Aisha that she is still resting. However, Aisha clarifies that it's actually for her. Confused, Duo Duo asks why, and Aisha's response shocks her. The community believes Sheikha will soon ascend to heaven, and she will be the new Lady Angel. Say what? Duo Duo didn't sign up for this. Day after the attack, Duo Duo breaks into an underground vicinity, eager to find the inheritance of angels. She walks into a hall, filled with giant statues of the angels that came before Sheikha, and she can't help but feel uneasy. Aisha's words echo in her mind, reminding her of the impending ceremony for Sheikha, scheduled in just three days' time. The weight of expectation rests heavily on Duo Duo's shoulders, as the community eagerly anticipates her assuming leadership as the angelic figure. As Duo Duo recalls, Esha told her that every Lord Angel will sacrifice their body to the Holy Spirit Flame when they turn 17. This sacrificial act is believed to bestow blessings upon Shaja, allowing the departing angel to ascend to heavenly service. The successor, chosen by divine will, inherits the celestial powers from the ashes destined to become the next Lord Angel. Aisha can't help but feel hopeful, while telling this story as he is eager to have the chance to become an angel like Sheikha. I don't know about you, but this sounds like some crazy cult shenanigan. Just then, Duo Duo runs into a book locked by huge chains. She uses her powers to melt the chains, hoping the book states an alternative to sacrificing her friend. To her surprise, the book contains mystical arts of divination. Days later, Sheikha fights off a dragon puppet. She gets swallowed by the beast but she uses her powers to make its head explode. Sheikha then rushes to Duo Duo, and she catches her with a tied-up puppeteer. Sheikha reports that she has taken care of the dragon puppets, while Duo Duo informs her that she has done her tasks too, and even captured a puppeteer. Sheikha then hands some food to Duo Duo, apologizing that they can't have a warm meal, because they can't use fire. They're too close to the enemy stronghold, so they must settle with what they have. Duo Duo doesn't mind, but she does wonder why they're entering enemy territory themselves, when it appears too reckless. Additionally, Sheikha hasn't even fully recovered yet. With her nose dripping with blood, Sheikha argues that the injuries aren't that bad. She then commands Duo Duo to bring the hostages to the base, as she plans to do something on her own. Duo Duo wants to accompany her, but Sheikha forbids it, emphasizing that she has left her an order. Whoa, bossy much. Duo Duo realizes that Sheikha is making the most of her time before she meets her end. With this, Duo Duo is determined to put her plans to work. She holds a talisman in her hand, unsure whether it will work. Just then, the puppeteer screams at Duo Duo, telling her she doesn't know what she's doing. This man is quite the yapper. He just bit through Mimung's silk. The puppeteer adds that Duo Duo's plan will level the entire place into flat ground. Meanwhile, in the Shaja Eastern Separation Wall, the piercing sound of sirens fills the air. Meanwhile, one of the guards notices a bunch of purple feathers falling from the sky. Impossible. Did someone from Shaja infiltrate the place? Well, you know it, because Sheikha is ready to kick some GU's loser. She suddenly appears in front of the guard, killing him before he can react. As the realization dawns upon the other guards that they have been infiltrated, Sheikha finds herself surrounded by a group of GU's guards, leaving her cornered. Accusations of terrorism are hurled at her, and she is ordered to remain where she is. Fuming with anger, Sheikha can't comprehend the irony of being labeled a terrorist, when it was her people who were invaded. Suddenly, a guard rushes to the commander with alarming news. The 7th Dragon Puppet Division has been decimated, with not a single puppeteer spared. Furthermore, all the high-ranking commanders stationed at the advanced party camp have met the same fate at the hands of Sheikha. Yes, Queen. Slay, literally. The commander's fury ignites at the devastating report. He wonders what this Shaja trash is about to do. Why isn't she affected by the nullification stones, and could she be using the legendary angel inheritance? Nevertheless, the commander is unfazed. He reassures his men that her magic is related to her lifespan, and that it won't take long before she dies. With confidence in their advantage, he orders his men to set the sky ablaze and eliminate Sheikha. However, Sheikha only says that she can easily kill them all in a snap, even with the last drop of her strength. Suddenly, the GU's people rain fire on Sheikha, 
but they are no match for her fury. Using her holy health flame attack, multiple guards die with a single blow. As the commander's skin melts in the fire, he musters his last strength to activate a magical puppet to destroy Shaja to the ground. Meanwhile, Sheka is recovering from using her magic. Out of nowhere, an empire magic puppet breaks into the scene, eager to kill her. Sheka then sarcastically states that she's lucky to see the GU's secret weapon before she dies. She suddenly calls up blood, making it clear that she won't make it through her duel with the Imperial Puppet. However, Duo Duo comes to the rescue, ready to aid Sheka. Sheka is taken aback by the sudden appearance of Duo Duo, but before she can react, her condition worsens. As the angelic power within her begins to surge outward, Sheka can feel her life slipping away. With each passing moment, of course, her clothes are dissolving in the process. It's probably protocol. Just as Sheka is about to be attacked by the Imperial Puppet, Duo Duo intervenes, using her silk rope to pull her out of harm's way. Desperate to save Sheka, Duo Duo attempts to feed her with one of Mimung's cocoons, but she's too weak to even swallow it. Out of nowhere, the puppet attacks again, but Duo Duo manages to use her floating shadow and mortal magic to escape. Left with no choice, Duo Duo chews on the cocoon and spits it in Sheka's mouth. Okay, but when did this become Yuri coded? It turns out that Duo Duo had devised this plan three days prior, when she was searching for the secret of the angel inheritance. Duo Duo discovered that beings in the demon world possess eight nodes that regulate the flow of magic. Unleashing these nodes enhances magical power, but places an immense burden on the body. This revelation suggests that the angel selection process seeks people who are capable of bearing this immense power. However, once the cycle of magic energy ceases, so too does the wielder's life. Realizing that Sheka's death is inevitable, Duo Duo refuses to accept defeat. She recalls the teachings from Mammon, recognizing similarities between her mystical arts technique and the secret of the angels, both of which involve the manipulation of the eight gates. If Duo Duo can harness the workings of heaven and earth from the external world, and connect them to the body's internal processes, she may be able to restart Sheka's energy circulation. With newfound hope, Duo Duo is determined to embark on a three-day mission to secure the necessary elements for her plan. Meanwhile, Duo Duo is overjoyed that her plan worked. The mystical arts divination didn't fail her. However, the Imperial Puppet suddenly attacks, releasing a strong blow that sends the walls crumbling. Duo Duo manages to dodge it, all while carrying Sheka. However, She's beyond puzzled, as she notices that the puppet is using talismans. How could that have appeared in the demon world? Duo Duo then realizes that she's been severely injured from the last attack, making her incapable of using a single brain cell. Left with no choice, she uses a silkworm cocoon for herself, and wonders if she should summon Bai Luo Chun's puppet, as her energy is almost dried up. Before she can do so, the Imperial puppet lunges for a final blow, prompting Duo Duo to desperately cry out Sheikha's name. Just then, the place illuminates with a strong surge of power. Sheka's life is restored by the silkworm cocoon, and she promptly comes to Duo Duo's rescue. Overwhelmed with gratitude for Duo Duo's help, Sheka finds herself imbued with newfound strength. Duo Duo is glad to hear this, and she's proud to say that it's immortal magic taught to her by her senior, Manman. She also tells Sheka to remember that it's called the mystical art of divination. With her newfound power, Sheka puts Duo Duo to safety and fights off the Imperial Puppet. Finally, some break time for Duo Duo. In a split second, Sheka speeds towards the puppet and releases a mystical arts attack, amputating the puppet's arm. Sheka realizes that the overflowing magic that was supposed to kill her has disappeared, and thanks to Duo Duo, she now feels a powerful and gentle strength. Just then, the puppet releases another attack, refusing to surrender. Sheka spits out two consecutive mystical arts attacks, causing a massive explosion that ultimately kills the Imperial Puppet. Finally, she can breathe, as Shaja is now safe. Unexpectedly, Duo Duo approaches Sheka, offering a lily flower and extending birthday wishes. Grateful for the gesture, Sheka blushes, aware of the flower's symbolic meaning. Despite Duo Duo's innocence in the matter, Sheka appreciates the sentiment. Just to state the obvious, in Japan, it's a Yuri thing, where one initiates to do the nasty. It seems like Duo Duo didn't receive the memo, encouraging Sheka to make a wish. Duo Duo watches as Sheka hopes for Shaja's prosperity. With their wishes made, the two set off on their journey back to Shaja. 
In the GU's frontline command post, the senior officials convene for a crucial meeting. A report comes in detailing the destruction of an experimental demonic puppet, man's significant casualties suffered by the advanced party in Shanja City. Despite this setback, terrorist activities have intensified. However, Yatani, the commander-in-chief of the GU's allied forces, interrupts further updates. Is it just me, or does he look like Hitler? Yatani commands the other men to leave the room, except for Luther, the army chief, Jacob, the special forces chief, and Arthur, the motorized dragon puppet tactical unit commander. As expected, the three receive a yapping session from Yatani. The echoing yapping of dupe Hitler carries beyond the confines of the room, reaching the ears of other officers stationed outside. Yatani scorns the trio, labeling them as idiots for squandering the demonic puppets. Although he's enraged, he's relieved by the fact that the Empire has agreed to send more demonic puppets. However, Jacob reluctantly delivers the news that the Empire has encountered complications and will no longer provide assistance. As you may expect, Hitler here went wild. Meanwhile, in the Empire's outskirts lies the Luoma Research Institute. Inside the building is a gory scene. Two lifeless demons are tied by the neck, while some arrows pierce their eyes and body. An assassin has infiltrated the vicinity, leaving the demon scientists dead. Meanwhile, Zi Ling is the sole survivor, still inhabiting the body of Rokoko. Just then, a rogue arrow pierces through her neck, but she's unfazed. She pulls it out without stressing, as she has used a ton of silkworm slow beforehand. She then calls out to her co-researchers, Kate and Doug, wondering if anyone is in the room with her. Meanwhile, Nu, a member of the Dark Demon team, is in disbelief as she witnesses how the arrow didn't affect Zi Ling. However, she knows that she mildly delayed the progress of the demonic puppet's development, so her mission is not in vain. Nevertheless, she can't help but speculate that Rukako is not who she says she is. She is merely an upper-ranked demon researcher, but why is she so evil? Suddenly, a dead scientist gets possessed by unknown magic, prompting it to attack Nu. Her startled reaction catches the attention of Zi Ling, who now knows she's hiding on the top floor. Upon realizing that the undead attempted to attack her, Nu gets consumed by horror, knowing that this is an unkillable target. She screams at the top of her lungs, hoping to be saved. Just then, Zi Ling appears, saying that no one can hear her desperate screams. After all, she killed everyone in the vicinity. Zi Ling is infuriated that she had a lot of losses, so she demands Nu to compensate for the inconvenience. Meanwhile, Nu realizes that Zi Ling's bizarre magic and manner of speaking are not normal, leading her to conclude that she's not Rokoko and is someone from the Cultivation Realm. Right on, Unicorn Girl, and because of that, you will be rewarded with a painless death. However, Nu suddenly brings out a talisman, calling Zi Ling a Cultivation Devil. She plans to use the talisman to kill herself, worried that Zi Ling might use her forbidden magic to interrogate her soul. However, before she can do so, someone cuts off Mu's hand. Within a split second, a sword pierces through the poor demon's skull, ultimately killing her. Zi Ling commends the killer, who is no other than her co-researcher, Kate. Zi Ling then summons Nu's amputated hand, and she discovers that the demon attempted to use a soul-breaking talisman. The plot thickens, and Zi Ling gets excited, as she realizes that the cultivation realm is involved with the issues of the demon realm. Days before this gruesome incident, two major clients commissioned missions for Nu and her comrade, Crow. Nu has been assigned to the Demon Puppet Research Institution, while Crow has been tasked with the Southern Abyssal Mine. Before departing, Crow informed Nu that he plans to resign and return home after completing the mission, and this has been approved by their boss. Nu congratulated him, though she acknowledged that she couldn't leave the team. She still has five more missions to fulfill before she can do so. Nu then asks about Crow's plans upon returning home, and he replies that he wants to become a baker. After all, his savings are enough for him and Mew to last a lifetime. Nu is shocked to hear that Crow has included her in his plans, so she clarifies what he means by this. Just then, Crow hands her a ring, asking her to marry him. Once they complete the mission, not gonna lie, I feel a bit mad at Zi Ling now. As Zi Ling peers into the story, linked to the talisman, she discovers that Nu's boss wants to gain the favor of both parties. If the Empire had an important arrangement at the Abyssal Mine, it would make sense why they turned a blind eye to the serious internal battles. Zi Ling reckons that the talisman came from a master, and whoever this is must be tangled in a messy situation. However, in the meantime, Zi Ling has to figure out how to solve the issue of charging the demonic puppets. As Zi Ling leaves the room, 
a guard apologizes for failing to assist her. She pays him no heed, but instructs him to clean building A. Meanwhile, Zi Ling can't care to be bothered about who ordered the assassination. Whoever these people are must be planning to go independent, and they're not respecting the emperor. It doesn't matter. Once she puts up her hiring advertisement tomorrow, those two will be fuming in anger. Later on, Zi Ling heads to the basement of building B to visit Chrissy, a researcher. She asks about the research progress, but Chrissy can't help, but show appreciation for being included in the project. Zi Ling says there's no need to thank her, as she looks at the potential of everyone. Chrissy then updates her, that the battery problem of the demon puppet is solved, and its battle time has been increased to three days. Plus, it can also be mass-produced. This news brings joy to Zi Ling, so she praises Chrissy for a job well done. Finally, Zi Ling has a personal asset. Somewhere in the lower level of the abyssal mine, an ancient dragon howls in solitude. Bai Luo Chun and Wei La stand on the beast's back, fighting about who should be the boss in this situation. Bai demands that they turn back, but Wei La persists and insists that they go on another path. Enraged, Bai calls Wei La an idiot who has no sense of direction. Oh, so we're allowed to say that now. He accuses her of worsening the situation, and now they have been going in circles. It has been days, and they're still lost. Wei La, angry that he's being so stubborn, addresses Bai with his identification number to assert dominance. She then stresses that she's the head maid, so he should listen to her. Bai gets pissed after being reduced to his identification number, and he reminds her that they're in this situation because of her and that dumb dragon. Wei La gets emotional, and she tells Bai that the dragon's name is Ah Dai. She reminds him that he's talking to authority, and that he has no right to disrespect her like that. However, Bai doesn't give a single flying F, and he sarcastically asks her how many days they've been wandering. He goes on to ask if she doesn't care about her master and the people above. He then asserts that they need to find their way back, to ensure that the people above are safe. Wait, Law refuses to back down, insisting that her mission is to investigate the truth. Plus, her sixth sense, which I doubt works, is telling her which path is the right one. She also clarifies that Lucy is not weak, and she can protect herself just fine. You might be curious about how these two ended up in this situation. Well, three days ago, when Bai was in the abyssal mines with David, Melt, and Thousand Faces, they found themselves doubting if they'd make it out alive. Bai is frustrated that he can't do much as the system has been inactive for days. Just then, David notices an incoming airship, and aboard it is Lucy and Yazi. Yazi is horrified upon seeing the horde of death worm larvae. Meanwhile, Lucy worries about the consequences. If the creatures climb out of the mine, the other side with the elevator has fallen, and if they don't find the root cause of this chaos, it might just fall into their doom. She also wonders if the death worm larvae are undead creatures. Just then, Yezi notifies Lucy of the people that she can see at the bottom of the mines. Lucy urges Yezi to rescue them, but their airship suddenly loses control after getting shot down. It turns out that Melt is responsible for this, saying that she sensed an upper-ranked black demon and couldn't resist. Thousand Faces can only sigh, telling Melt that the people in that airship might have come to save them. Luckily, Lucy was quick enough to use her magic to keep her and Yazi afloat. Below, Thousand Faces reminds Melt not to fire more attacks. Meanwhile, Lucy speculates that the people down below are rebels. It might be dangerous, so she's sending her camera bug to record everything while they make their way back. However, she means no ill will to buy in the others, so she releases a magic frost spell to create a barrier that will keep the creatures out. Bai is amazed at Lucy's capabilities, while David can't help but fawn over his crush. Lucy then makes her presence known, informing the group that she has frozen the creatures. She encourages them to evacuate the stronghold, while she deals with the death-worn larvae using her powers. Additionally, she suggests that they put aside past conflicts. Thousand Faces is amused that the young lady came down by herself. She then jokes to Melt, telling her that her life is spared, despite firing an attack at Lucy. Meanwhile, Lucy asks Xie Zi to contact Wei La. She can't sustain this magic for long, as the area is too massive. Xie Zi replies that Wei La is close by, but she's surprised after realizing that their locations have overlapped. Out of nowhere, Wei La plummets from the sky, punching a colossal dragon into submission. She screams at the giant beast called Ah Dai, claiming it as her pet. That's quite an entrance there, Wei La. Meanwhile, Thousand Faces escapes with Melt, using a flying device. She's impressed by the head maid, and she finally figures out why the Lord Duke was disloyal. Hold up, Wei La's a homewrecker? Melt, on the other hand, wonders if there's anyone normal in Wilton Manor. 
This is the demon realm. Is anything ever normal? Meanwhile, Bai tosses David into the sky, hoping that he'd make it to Lucy and Yazi. Fortunately, he lands right into their floating sphere, and Lucy even ends up carrying him like a bride. He blushes, and he expresses how thrilled he is to finally see Lucy again. Lucy, on the other hand, doesn't even remember this bloke. Witnessing this stranger appearing out of nowhere, Yazi screams at David to let go of Lucy. I think it's the other way around, girl. Meanwhile, Bai attempts to escape, completely forgetting that he doesn't have enough spiritual energy to fly. Just then, he notices a drive-in with Wei La. Meanwhile, Wei La gets approached by the camera bug, and she receives praise from Lucy, as they have found the insect's nest because of her. Lucy has an additional task for her, which is to discover the truth about the cause of the undead's resurrection. With this, Lucy leaves the mines with David and Yazi, while Wei La, Ah Dai, and Bai Luo Chun fall into the lower level of the abyssal mines. Now, the two are stuck together, left with no choice but to collaborate. Wei La commands Ah Dai to follow her directions, eager to discover the truth about the undead's resurrection. Meanwhile, Bai Luo Chun commands the system to return his spiritual energy, but to no avail. Wei La wonders why Bai Luo Chun is eager to return to the manor. They have a more prestigious mission at hand, and you should be thankful that he has been considered for it. Eh, she probably just wants to go on a rampage. Bai Lu Chun breaks Wei La's bubble, clarifying that they don't have the same goals. If they can't find the way back within a day, he will venture out on his own. Just then, Wei La grabs Bai by the neck using her tail. Bai is shocked by what he sees. Maybe Wei La's sixth sense does work after all. Wei La has led them to a mysterious looking portal. Bai Lu Chun then walks towards it, and he's beyond surprise that prompted the system to activate. Out of nowhere, a beautiful mommy milker with thunder thighs appears, and she's calling Bai darling. The system is worried that Bai doesn't know her, and true enough, our MC is beyond confused. He's more concerned that his virtual system disappeared. Bai, my man, you literally have the better version. However, it turns out that the system is only visible to Bai. Meanwhile, Wei La is pissed at Bai, because he seems to be slacking. If only she knew that Bai's movements are limited, because the system is overly clingy to him. Just then, Wei La notices something emerging from the portal. Just then, Crow exits the portal, looking all buff with a single arm. I didn't even notice this man had one arm. Just then, within a split second, Crow suddenly springs from the ground and cuts Ade's head with a single attack, immediately killing the mighty dragon. Wei La is alarmed by this high-ranking demon, so she notifies Bai to prepare himself, as they may have to fight. Meanwhile, Bai Lu Ochun has no energy to do anything. Imagine having a grown woman cling to you 24 sevenths. Wei La is fired up, and she suddenly accelerates into the sky to fight Crow. As the fight ensues, Wei La ends up on the ground, with Crow's sword against her face. However, she breaks the sword with a single hand and follows it up with a powerful punch. Wei La's attack is so strong that it even decapitates Crow. Man, this woman can be scary sometimes. However, to her surprise, Crow's beheaded body moves on its own, prompting Wei La to believe that this is caused by death resurrection. Before Crow can attack her, his body suddenly falls to the ground, revealing a glowing symbol on his back. Just then, Bai Luo Chun calls out to Wei La, revealing Crow's head in his hand. It turns out that Bai Luo Chun has already subdued Crow's soul, preventing him from reviving himself. He has also subdued Ade's soul, so it won't resurrect as one of those crazy zombies. Bai Lu Chun concludes that the current predicament with the zombies isn't a result of resurrection after death. Instead, he suspects that someone is manipulating their souls. This phenomenon has been recently called the soul virus, but Bai Lu Chun asserts that there's no such thing. Nevertheless, he is convinced that the soul sect is somehow involved in the situation. Now, they must adjust their plans and concentrate on uncovering the identity of the person controlling the souls of the undead. Later on, Wei La buries the remains of Ah Dai, vowing revenge. However, she notices that Bai Lu Ochun isn't paying his respects, and appears rather jittery. Oh, Wei La, if only you knew he has an invisible melon mommy clinging to his arms. Bai Lu Ochun brushes off Wei La's observations, and instead urges her to enter the portal quickly. The sooner they resolve the issue, the better. Wei La feels a bit disheartened that he's rushing her, despite her recent loss. However, Bai Lu Ochun explains that they need to return soon, or else the maids might become unruly without them. 
Wei La realizes there's no time to lose, so she quickly changes her mood in a snap. She then urges Bai Luo Chun to join her in beating up the main culprit. Bai Luo Chun, on the other hand, struggles to walk because the system is sticking too close to him. Meanwhile, Lucy, Ya Zi, and David wander in the upper level of the abyssal mines using an aircraft. David is worried that Bai and Wei La haven't contacted them for a few days, and he's even more concerned about Wei La. He knows Bai Luo Chun can take care of himself, but Wei La is merely a lower-ranked demon. Oh, David, you know nothing. With this, Lucy tells him Wei La is an exception to the typical white demons, because she's powerful. Lucy adds that her father once told her not to use rankings as a reason to judge people, and David should definitely not judge Wei La of all people. Nobody in the demon realm can even beat her in arm wrestling. Additionally, Lucy reassures David that there is no need to be occupied with Wei La and Bai's safety. What they must prioritize is to prevent the spread of the soul virus. Hearing this lecture, David realizes that Bai Luo Chun and Wei La are a fated match. On top of having great powers, their horns are both short too. David, you're definitely ruining your shot with Lucy. Yezi calls him out, saying that he can't casually point out a woman's small horn. I guess that's the equivalent of calling someone flat-chested, huh? Yezi adds that the weakest one in the group is David, as he hasn't even recovered from his previous injuries. David denies Yezi's allegations, insisting that he's all good now. He also reminds her not to judge him by his rank, suggesting he's more powerful than she thinks. Just then, Lucy notices a flock of abyssal birds flying towards them. David figures that this would be a great time to showcase the skill that Bai Luo Chun taught him. Lucy might just be impressed. However, Lucy realizes that these are mere abyssal birds, but a much more powerful beast called the Abyssal Winged Dragon. To make matters worse, these beasts are infected by the soul virus. They must have been attracted to the strong surge of powers coming from them. Lucy immediately commands Yazi to take the airship and escape with David. Yazi complies, but the stupid David wants to impress Lucy. He offers to take care of the winged dragons, using the cultivation technique that Bai Luo Chun taught him. David casts a blood destruction talisman, killing one of the beasts with one hit. Yazi is shocked that David had a trick up on his sleeve, but now she wants him to kill the rest. Um, he hasn't exactly prepared for that. Unbeknownst to David, the winged dragon king is right behind him, ready to gobble his sorry face. Yezzi screams at him to dodge, while Lucy focuses on harnessing her magic for an attack. With a single command, Lucy causes the beast's guts to explode, staving David. After killing the king, she goes on to finish off the other beast with a powerful spell. With the worst being over, Lucy gives David a pat on the head, reminding him not to act so recklessly again. Well, that's embarrassing. Meanwhile, Bai Luo Chun and Wei La enter the portal and find themselves in the Demon Venerable's secret realm. Bai Luo Chun is surprised to see the manor's asset, but Wei La clarifies that the Duke has never mentioned that this place existed in the depths of the mines. She adds that the words don't seem to originate from the Demon Realm. Bai can read it, and he finds that the Demon Venerable is sealed in the area. Impressed that Bai Luo Chun can read the words, Wei La presses her cheek against his, why is everyone being so touchy? He adds that those are the words of his hometown, and it's a very remote area, so it makes sense if she doesn't know how to read them. Just then, Bai figures out the truth about the place. He shares with Wei La that the holy talismans pasted on the coffins are soul-refining talismans. The quality is quite high, yet there are so many. This means that those resurrected corpses have been eroded by these talismans, and they have become flesh puppets that are only capable of stealing living souls. From Bai Luo Chun's understanding, there are only four divine talisman masters in the cultivation realm who could potentially be responsible. Given his familiarity with the three of them, it seems unlikely that they would venture into the demon realm. Wei La proposes that the fourth master might be the culprit, but Bai Luo Chun dismisses the notion. He argues that this master is known for his righteousness and gentleness. Wei La wonders if the fourth master and Bai Luo Chun are close, as he seems to know him personally. Bai nervously replies that the master is famous because of his kindness. He quickly changes the topic, telling Wei La the solution to their problem. First, they must destroy the tomb and tear off the lid of the coffin. Seems easy, right? Well, not really. A giant hand suddenly clamps down on Wei La's wrist. Misa, the demon venerable, fumes with anger because they're disrespecting his resting place by standing atop his grave. Plus, 
they plan to uncover the lid of his coffin. Just then, Wei La commands the demon to release her. Infuriated, Misa asserts his dominance as the boss of the demon world and even proclaims himself a god. Suddenly, a dawning realization strikes Misa as he acknowledges Wei La and Bai Lu Ochun's strength in breaching the realm. Suddenly, Wei La swiftly stabs Misa's eye with her hand, allowing her to break free. Misa lets out a bunch of curse words, which I can't disclose because we don't want to get demonetized. Wei La suddenly speaks in the demon's native tongue, telling him he's rude and uneducated for grabbing people's hands when he hasn't asked for permission. Misa is furious that she's talking back to him, and because of this, he won't allow her to leave the place alive. The powerful demon wants to fight Wei La one-on-one. -on -one. Misa suddenly releases an Extinction Ultimate Black Dragon Wave attack, but Wei La counters with a clay pot punch. This sends the demon flying into the distance, his guts spilling out of his belly. Witnessing this match, Bai Luo Chun finally realizes why that dragon followed her despite being affected by the soul-refining talisman. Her raw power is just beyond explanation. With Misa dead, Wei La urges Bai Luo Chun to help her destroy the demon's grave. Bai tells her that she already did, and all that's left to do is to open it and burn everything inside. However, a tentacled shadow suddenly emerges from the grave, grabbing Bai Luo Chun. Wei La runs to save him, but she's held back by Misa, who has revived himself. The demon is excited to meet a powerful demon like her, and he wants to test how long she can last. Meanwhile, Bai Lu Ochun gets greeted by the tentacled shadow, telling him he's the first to enter the realm in a very long time. While listening, Bai confirms that the source of the soul is before him. It seems like Wei La has to fend for herself for a bit. Just then, Bai Lu Ochun tells the shadow that there is no soul-related magic in the demon world. For this entity to exist in the form of a soul, there must be someone behind it. Suddenly, a demon emerges from the shadows, praising Bai for his knowledge about souls. The entity claims to be the Demon Venerable, the god of malignity and trickery. He claims that the demon fighting Wei La is simply a divine body prepared by the soul sect for him to extend his life. He also claims that his caliber is quite high. However, Bai Luo Chun notices that the demon is kneeling, which leads him to doubt just how powerful he is. The Demon Venerable replies that the soul sect will be able to fully resurrect him in a short bit. But in the meantime, he wants Bai Luo Chun to help him. And if he finally merges with a body, he will grant Bai with all of his wishes. Meanwhile, Bai wonders if this is the demon who brought destruction to Yun Huang. It sure looks like half-cooked meat. Just then, Bai Luo Chun realizes that the body and soul fusion is what Mammon needs, leading him to think twice about the offer. The demon venerable spits out some recommendations of what Bai might like. Does he want authority, land, female demons, or male ones? He won't judge with the latter. When Bai Luo Chun doesn't give a response, the demon suggests that they conquer the world and split evenly at 50-50. He even cranks it up to 70 to 30. Despite the demon's pressure, Bai remains calm, telling the demon venerable that he's disturbing his thoughts. If Bai Luo Chun assesses himself, his spiritual energy is quite dry, and his system is inconsistent. Even if he does summon the system, all she will ever do is stick to her like a leech. Meanwhile, the demon allows Bai to ponder on his decisions. He even recommends becoming Bai Luo Chun's lackey, if that's what it takes to help him. Man, can this demon be into Bai or something? Finally, Bai speaks up, stating that he wants the demon to give him the technique for merging the body and soul. He's about to continue speaking, but the demon suddenly lifts him in the air with one hand. He's been fooled. The demon venerable then states that Bai's time is up. He also stresses that in the demon race, the soul is resurrected as long as it recovers in the realm. The demon is proud of himself for tricking Bai Luo Chun, and he looks down upon the people who thought that soul-refining locks were enough to contain him. After he kills Bai Luo Chun, he will also kill that idiot from the soul sect and everyone else from the cultivation world. However, before the demon venerable can kill Bai Luo Chun, someone suddenly slashes his arm. It's the system, and she's come to save her darling master. The system asks Bai if he's alright, and he replies that he is. However, he blames the system for everything that is happening. If she only returned his spiritual energy, everything would have been easier. However, the system tells them that there are some things that he has to remember on his own. Before she can utter another word, the demon venerable abruptly bursts into laughter, claiming to recall something. He appears to recognize someone, though his words are nonsensical. Amidst the demon's manic laughter, 
the system swiftly terminates him with a single touch. The demon doesn't get the chance to finish his sentence, but the system hints that he is about to mention Heaven's Tao. Suddenly, Bai Lu Ochun collapses. The system merely looks at him, ignoring the notifications that the system upgrade has been completed. In Shaja City, a colossal imperial puppet wreaks havoc on the land. Duo Duo valiantly battles against it, but she sustains injuries in the process. Unfortunately, the demon puppets are growing increasingly powerful. Suddenly, a powerful laser beam strikes Duo Duo, inflicting fatal wounds on her. The GU soldier, using a dragon puppet to launch the attack, rejoices that he successfully hit his target. He proudly informs his comrades that their new dragon puppet team has achieved a significant victory. However, his excitement fades when he notices his fellow soldiers' lack of response. To his shock, they are under the control of a green-hued aura, appearing lifeless and devoid of will. Meanwhile, Sheka rescues Duo Duo, and she immediately asks if she's alright. Duo Duo struggles to breathe and she tells Sheka that she barely survived that attack. Because of this, Sheka suggests that she return to the castle. Duo Duo lacks the mystical arts, needed to restore her strength, and the toll of the battle is proving too heavy for her to bear. However, Duo Duo refuses. She reassures Sheka not to worry, as she still has a few tricks up her sleeve. Just then, Duo Duo accelerates into the sky, leaving Sheka with no choice but to accompany her. However, upon seeing the scene below, they quickly realize that the GU's people have been wiped out. A green aura seems to surround the soldiers, including her dragon puppet. Duo Duo anticipates a bigger dilemma. Meanwhile, Sheka wonders what the problem is, so Duo Duo breaks it to her that these people didn't die from the battle. Their souls were sucked out, and now they are under control. Duo Duo quickly realizes that someone is using the battle of the Jiyus and Shaja people as a means to reap souls. Just then, streaks of green light swiftly ascend to the sky, almost hitting Duo Duo and Sheka. Before Duo Duo's eyes, the truth becomes unmistakable. This is the soul sex secret magical arts. Suddenly, they spot a massive aircraft in the skies, under the control of a mysterious group of cultivators from the soul sect. In unison, they recite a chant that seals a demon, preventing it from entering the cycle of reincarnation. Just then, the leader of the soul sect cultivators orders his comrades to summon the sacrificial altar. The ground splits open, unveiling an ominous demon plant lurking beneath. With the combined power of the cultivators, a Sumatero flower comes to life. Upon spotting the flower, Duo Duo recalls seeing it in a culinary book from the Immortal Cultivation World, authored by Bai Luo Chun. She realizes that the Soul Sect cultivators are planning to summon something evil. Because of this, Duo Duo urges Sheka to merge their powers to destroy the flower. Sheka agrees, but before they can act, a pair of demon puppets soar into the sky to attack them. As the demon puppets rain attacks on Duo Duo and Sheka, the leader of the Soul Sect is amused that some random rats got mixed into his plans. Meanwhile, the demon puppets persist in their attack, so Duo Duo instructs Sheka to make the puppets explode, using the mystical arts. Out of nowhere, Sheka unleashes an Eight Gates divination attack, completely annihilating the demon puppets. Duo Duo praises Sheka for mastering this powerful skill. However, she quickly warns Sheka that they should brace themselves for potential challenges ahead. In response, Sheka expresses confidence, affirming that as long as she has Duo Duo by her side, they can overcome anything. Okay, lesbians. Meanwhile, a battleship hovers nearby, bearing witness to the GU's people's destruction of Shaja. On board are David, Ye Zi, and Zi Ling. David can't help but seethe with anger towards the Empire, feeling betrayed by the numerous secrets they've kept from their citizens. They were unaware that the mines were actually supplying energy to the demon puppets. Meanwhile, Ye Zi updates Lucy that there's still no news about Bai Luo Chun and Wei La. Lucy becomes increasingly worried upon hearing this news, and her distress deepens as she realizes how much her father has concealed from her. All this time, she believed that mining the Abyss Magic Crystals was meant to address the energy crisis and improve the lives of the commoners, but it was all an act. Just then, someone approaches Lucy, and it's no other than Zi Ling, asking if the lady is satisfied with the power of the demon puppets. Zi Ling shares that since the demon puppets joined the battle, the city of Shaja was easily destroyed. Two of the infamous angels are left to resist. And now, victory is within their grasp. 
With a nonchalant expression, Lucy asks Zi Ling if she's the person in charge. The latter confirms, adding that she created the demon puppets herself. Knowing that Wilton Manor is the main source of funds behind the demon puppet plan, Zi Ling ensures that she performs well in front of the financial banker. She then attempts to shake hands with Lucy, introducing herself as senior researcher, Rokoko. Lucy extends her hand, saying that she'll be sure to remember Rokoko, the creator of the massacre robots. Girl, Shade. Zi Ling doesn't know what the lady is implying, but she remains calm. Although Lucy is strongly gripping her hand. Just be thankful it's your hand, and not your neck. Meanwhile, a strong force descends from the sky, narrowly missing the Soul Sect and their battleship. In the battleground, Duo Duo continues her relentless struggle against a demon puppet. By sheer coincidence, the powerful force lands directly on the puppet, sparing Duo Duo from additional work. Despite her immediate relief, she remains vigilant and wary. 